Inside Africa, in association with Zenith Bank. Snaking its way from KwaZulu Natal, South Africa, up through the Drakensberg Escarpment and into the mountain kingdom of Lesotho, the Sani Pass is a steep, zigzagging gravel road that started as a bridle path. It was never sort of meant to be. It was really a bridle trail for pack animals, which informally became a road. But as a consequence, it has an amazing charm. It's really, really beautiful. And it has what I think has come to be called a sense of place that's really quite unique. This historical link between two countries and two cultures runs through Maloti Drakensberg Park, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, surrounded by natural beauty and pristine wilderness. The view is amazing. It's like nothing has been seen before. The Sani Pass is now a tourism hotspot. This rugged route is an increasingly popular destination for adventure sports. The pass is used for adventure racing. They do a cycle race as well, mountain biking, up and down. Etched out of minerals, including sandstone and dolomite, the future of this gravel road that leads to what some call the roof of Africa is up in the air as the road is set to be tarred, potentially putting the natural wilderness and the tourism industry at risk. At Sunny Pass in winter, it is mostly like below minus 12 degrees. So anything like uh, concrete is likely to crack. How are they going to keep that road in a good condition? I'm so worried. This is the Sunny Pass. This is Inside Africa. of all mountain passes in Southern Africa. The Sani Pass snakes up South Africa's Drakensberg Mountains and into Lesotho, climbing 1,332 vertical meters to an altitude of 2,876 meters at the top. Once a treacherous trade route, this historical pass weaves around sandstone cliffs and majestic overlooks, inviting adventurers from around the world. In 1932, the pass was turned into a bridle path, opening the area up to tourism and travelers. It's still a challenging climb. Four by fours are the only vehicles allowed on the road. Elias Mufukeng is a tour operator who helps visitors up and down the pass while explaining its origins and history. The South African border control is actually just below uh, the pass. Uh, after stamping uh, going through, we still drive in South Africa for another eight kilometers. Actually, after the South African border control, uh, that's where we engage our low gear, four by four. We're gonna climb above 2,000 meters. Sitting between the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans, the mountains were formed more than 100 million years ago by ancient volcanic eruptions, shifting tectonic plates, and carved out by the slow, steady process of erosion. When it combines with water, the, the lava just cools off and it solidifies, becomes a rock. And the second one pushes at the same point. That whole area began bulging up and up and up and up and up, forcing the ocean water east and west. The front of the Drakensberg, the water flows to the Indian Ocean. And the back of the Drakensberg, the water flows to the Atlantic Ocean. But when the land is actually forced up, the water moves lower and lower. Wherever the water stops, is always gonna deposit something, which is why we see the lines of the sedimentary sandstones. This geological wonder opened up with the Mkhotong Mountain Transport Company, or MMT. 
Mike Clark was one of the MMT partners and has also written books on the history of the Sani Pass. In the very beginning, it was purely a freight operation uh, to try and speed up the transfer of food from Natal into Mokotlong. And uh, when the mule trains were doing it, it took them two days to cover the 50-odd miles. And in that time, summertime, you go through two thunderstorms and so on and so forth. The animal might even lie down on the river to cool off and the goods would arrive a bit soiled. So it was to try and improve the, those conditions. Charlie Major, owner of Major Adventures, has traveled the Sani Pass since the age of four. His father was also a part of MMT. When they took the goods up, you'd have the odd tourist wanting to go up and they would just jump in, in amongst the goods and go with. And I think with um, Arthur Champkins was the guy that really started the tourist side of things and the transport became redundant. The uh, advent of the motorised transport meant that there was a building boom in Mokotlong. They were able to build a lot of housing for government servants and a lot of new hospital and all sorts of things like that. And although there are many routes that reach Lesotho, there's something quite different about taking the Sani. There's no other roads that go up through the actual escarpment part of the Drakensberg. The Sani Pass was one of the most amazing roads really in, in, in Southern Africa, certainly, in that um, it was never sort of meant to be. It was really a bridle trail for pack animals, which informally became a road. And um, so it probably should never be there. And I think if anyone had actually planned to build a road pass, they probably would never have done that. But as a consequence, it has an amazing charm and um, it's really, really beautiful. And it has, you know, what I think's come to be called a sense of place that's really quite unique. It's the only road from the KwaZulu Natal side up through the Drakensberg escarpment and into the mountain kingdom of Lesotho. Russell Suchet is the owner and operator of Sani Lodge Backpackers and has also written in detail about hiking the Sani Pass. The Drakensberg is wilderness. People ask me, are there no signs on the trails? I say, no, there are no signs on the trails because that's against the wilderness ethic of the place. And of course, traveling up the Sani Pass is actually cheating because it's a way for someone to get that experience without putting on a backpacking hiking for two, three days. They can, there's nowhere else in the Drakensberg you can reach the top of the escarpment without being a hiker, a dedicated hiker. The Sani Pass allows anybody to get that experience. So I think that to me is, is really what makes this area so incredibly special. While breathtaking in its beauty, the Sani Pass is also known for its often unforgiving weather conditions. Now, Lesotho, we call it the mountain kingdom because uh, it is very high. 75% of the country Lesotho is mountainous. Tour guides take people on this road to Lesotho and have learned to embrace the unpredictable. When they say you can have four seasons in the Berg, they are talking about this place. So it could be beautiful like this. Next minute, it's windy over 100 kilometers per hour the wind speeds and next minute it can start snowing and I've had many incidences like that. At the top of this pass on the Lesotho side is what is thought to be the highest pub in Africa called the Sani Top Chalet. It's a popular spot to test the local Maluti beer and take in the magnificent view. So originally this place was actually a um, an outpost for the Mukhotlong Mounted Police. Inside the pub, it's the ambiance, basically. It's the atmosphere. There's just that sense of togetherness, happiness. Everyone is relaxed. I think that beer makes it better, of course. Whether you are South African, European, American, it's just the place to be. Up ahead, a closer look at the lifestyle of Basotho shepherds living atop the Sani Pass. Thinking of banking in Africa, think Zenith. In today's fast-moving, fast-changing world, you need a financial partner that understands your unique expectations. 
a bank with presence in major financial centers across the world, with the enabling platform to facilitate seamlessly whenever, wherever, however. A bank with best-in-class financial solutions from a superb combination of technology and human touch for easy, fast, and secure banking that creates real value. Turning dreams into reality is now in your hands. People. Technology. Service. Zenith Bank. In your best interest. This one looks empty. What do you think? Oh, dude, stop. What? I got a ring. What are we supposed to do? Well, tell you what I'd do. I'd start running. That's, that's my now, gentlemen, okay, hustle! Go, go, go. Does your doorbell do that? Ours does. Get tough on crime with the Ring Video Doorbell. Keep your home and your neighborhood safe. Available at ring.com. Live from New Hampshire, the first major candidate event of the 2020 presidential campaign. Sanders, Harris, Warren, Klobuchar, Buttigieg on the same stage, back to back. Tuesday on CNN. This is CNN. Wrapped in blankets, wearing gum boots and pointed grass hats, the Vasutu shepherds live a nomadic lifestyle with their sheep in tow. They have been traveling up and down the Sani Pass from Lesotho to South Africa for trade regularly for decades. Wool is Lesotho's biggest export, and local legend has it, there are more sheep in the country than people. It's incredible because it's a mountain kingdom, and in Africa it's fairly unique in that respect. Um, the top of Sani Pass and those the alpine regions are well over 3,000 meters, and the Basotho people over the years moved further and further up the valleys, in other words, to higher and higher altitudes. And Lesotho developed this kind of way of life. Mapaseka is a young Basotho woman who runs a tourism operation in her village. It's a small village that is in between two rivers. We are not more like modernized and people living there, we have like mixed, we have young generation and we have old people. And in my, uh, in my uh, village, out of 10, we have only three people that I would say they are educated. Since I've started working as a tour guide, I have seen many difference that changing into my uh, small village. The kids are learning to adopt people. We also learn from them, like, how do they cook? How do they like and what they don't like? And we show them what we like and how do we cook and all this stuff. An advocate for sustainable tourism, she helps South African tour operators bring people into Lesotho for homestays and to experience the Basotho culture firsthand. No trees. We left the tree line at about 2,300 meters above sea level. So here, you can't uh, make fire. We're using uh, wood, so they'll have to use dry cow dung. They'll just come down into the Sohongan Valley until they reach to my village. And when they get there, they do overnight and where they experience to eat the Basutu homemade food. Today, local tour operators have partnered with the Basutu people to give tourists an authentic experience of their life and culture. The Basutu nation were formed by their, their first chief, and he offered sanctuary to people. He offered people a place on the top of his mountain, Tabo Bosiu, where they could come and find sanctuary from the, the turbulence of the times. And so the motto of Lesotho is Khotso Pula Nala, which is basically peace, rain and prosperity. And that comes through the people too, and the whole way they are. They're a very gentle, soft-spoken people. They're fiercely independent. And so you, you ended up with this very unique way of life developing in Lesotho, and as a consequence, a very unique culture. They live in little settlements called motibos, small, very simple thatched huts with a, a stone kraal where the animals would be kept overnight. The Basotho thatched huts, while simple, are ingenious in their architecture and use of natural resources. A round hut will take less of the wind, so it will not be blown away easily, okay? As you can see, it's quite a high floor. Now, that high floor actually prevents the water from coming in and flooding that hut. They're going to demonstrate how they used to 
after harvesting that wheat they would then grind that and that is what they would use to make bread beer and stuff like that <laughs> Just shows you what tourism can do if it's uh, if it's channeled the right way. Of course, tourism is a double-edged sword, and it can also create tremendous harm in areas if it's not done correctly. But we believe in that sustainable tourism model as uh, you know the way to go. Ahead, locals try to continue this sustainability in the face of uncertainty as authorities continue revamping the pass. Thinking of banking in Africa, think Zenith. In today's fast-moving, fast-changing world, you need a financial partner that understands your unique expectations. A bank with presence in major financial centers across the world, with the enabling platform to facilitate seamlessly, whenever, wherever, however. A bank with best-in-class financial solutions from a superb combination of technology and human touch for easy, fast, and secure banking that creates real value. Turning dreams into reality is now in your hands. People, technology, service. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. The Mueller report has arrived, answering some questions while raising some new ones. The president says he is totally cleared, but does the report tell a different story? President Trump's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, joins Jake. State of the Union, Sunday on CNN. takes you inside the world of horse racing. This month's winning post comes from Sydney, where the Wonder Mare Wink goes for her 33rd straight win in the Queen Elizabeth State, the final race of her record-breaking career. Winning post on CNN in association with Longines. this mountain border between KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, and Lesotho, travel is still a daily challenge. From walking along the Sani with donkeys to riding on 4 by 4s the mode of transport is constantly evolving. And in recent years, this jagged route has become a unique destination for adventure enthusiasts. Josiah Skeets is a young Englishman who has been cycling across the globe for nearly four years. He's headed up the pass on his bike from South Africa into Lesotho. So I've been on the bike for nearly three and a half years. I uh, cycled from England all the way to Australia, through Europe, Asia, and then through the outback of Australia. And then I've just hitched a ride on a boat, on a yacht, from Australia to Durban, South Africa. And now I'm cycling across South Africa and back to England. Steve Black is an extreme runner and has run up and down the pass hundreds of times. He's also the owner of Khotso Lodge and Horse Trails, which leads horse trips into Lesotho. It all began way back in 1982 when uh, I started doing a lot of running here in the mountains. When we started our horses here on the farm, we had to find horses in Lesotho, buy them, and then ride them down the pass, which was quite interesting. Sometimes the journeys were so long from the Sutu we'd end up um, actually sleeping on the pass. So the pass is used for different activities. In November of each year, we have what we call the Sani Stagger, and it literally is a bit of a stagger because by the time you finish the race, uh, you do stagger around for the next few days because you've trashed your legs. It started just as a downrun from the top of Sani to the Sani Pass Hotel, which is 21 kilometers, a half marathon. And then they decided to also have the standard marathon, which is up and down. So if you're really nuts, you do both of them. 
The Sani Stagger was started by some local runners to raise funds for widows and orphans of policemen. It has been going on for about 20 years now. Spurgeon Flemington, a local farmer, has organized the marathon for the past three years. Well, the Sani Pass is obviously an epic destination from a tourism point of view, but also from an adventure sport uh, perspective. Yeah, we've had mountain bike rides up here. We've obviously got the Sani Stager Marathon, probably unsurpassed in the world in terms of toughness and weirdness. <laughs> but, and then we also have events such as Ultra Trail Drakensberg, which incorporate the pass as well, where the guys climb, start at the SA border post and climb a thousand meters vert in the first eight k's of their of their 100k race so it's a pretty challenging start to their event and yeah the the signing pass just you know offers so many things to so many people one of those people is todd collins a local veterinary surgeon author and mountaineer who first hiked to the signing pass in 1968 in his time working here he's gone on a number of search and rescue missions along the pass when I went up with Ellen Champkins, who was a tour guide then, and we walked up, hiked up, climbed up through this waist-deep snow to see the situation with some tourists. This was 2002. Uh, and we, uh, I organized the helicopters from the South African Air Force, 15 Squadron, to come and airlift them out because they'd run out of food, they'd run out of water, fuel, they couldn't even melt s s snow for, for drinking water. They'd been up there for days and days and days, and the snow was oh, as deep as the windows, virtually. Um, but what really attracted the world's attention on that particular time was that to mark the helipad where this great big oryx had to land, I found a three-quarters empty bottle of tomato sauce, ketchup, and I used this to mark the H for the helipad. And this seemed to be the sort of factor that attracted everyone's attention, where a country vet and tomato sauce saved these families <laughs> from certain death. Well, here we are at the top of Sani Pass, the iconic Sani Pass, and we're about to start the downward uh, half marathon. And uh, it's become one of the great draw cards for the Underberg district, as Sani Pass has been for South Africa. And this event now is one of those on the bucket list of every even half serious runner. And uh, yeah, what can we say? It's in this bleak Lesotho here. The wind always howls. The people are freezing when they start. Uh, and they donate their, uh, their, their blankets and their jackets to charity to Lesotho people up here. Benefit from that way. It's a win-win for everyone. And uh, the great thing is that we're in the, one of the most beautiful part of, of the Lord's creation. The future of this site, however, is as unpredictable as the pass itself. Since the KwaZulu-Natal Transport Department approved the tarring of the Sani Pass to improve trade between the two countries. Well, the thing that we really don't like about the future of the pass is the fact that it's been upgraded, widened, straightened, um, improved, as they say, it's going to be tarred up to the border post and then they say they're going to put concrete from there onto the top because the tar wouldn't last one winter. Uh, it's taken the whole atmosphere of the pass away. The ethos is no longer there or will no longer be there. The people come from Europe, especially to see a dirt road, gravel surface, because they're not allowed to have them in Europe. and. Uh, it's going to destroy all that. It's just going to become another road which anybody can drive up and down. I know that change is inevitable, but I think if, if the, the past could be just kept more or less like it is now, maybe a little upgrade, but just to keep it as an adventurous route into Lesotho, uh, it, it is a such a well-known route it's uh, and it's it's beautiful it's too beautiful to destroy it we went through the process of uh, of trying to mitigate against it and suggest that there were other alternatives that would be better than tiring the sani pass well that's already now water under the bridge uh, the work has begun on the road it is heartbreaking I guess what's, what's been touted from the word go by those who are proponents of this project is that by improving this whole corridor, 
it will encourage a lot more people to come and explore this part of the world. While debates on how and why to best preserve the Sani Pass bring forth a myriad of opinions, they all conclude in trying to protect the authenticity of this historic route. And the fact that the San people lived there, the history and the geology of the pass is phenomenal. And then, of course, you get to the, the summit, you get to the world's finest pub. And for most people, whether you're motoring up the pass or hiking up um, or running up, if you're really tough, to get to that pub at the top and look out over this incredible pass, this feature, and have an ice cold Maluti beer or whatever your choice is. It is one of those special moments in life that, that yeah, makes it so special. Inside Africa, in association with Zenith Bank.